gripping upon the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. Talking a little bit this morning about the bondage breaker. The bondage breaker. Freeing us from all kinds of bondage. I think we realize that anything that comes into our life before the Lord Jesus Christ brings us into bondage. We call it an idol. You say, well, how do I know when I'm in bondage and when there's an idol in my life? How do I know? Well, usually when we put something before God and it becomes an idol in our life, we are willing to sin for it. We are willing to sin for it. And we hear things like, I've got to have this. I must have this. I absolutely need this. Life has no meaning for me without this. And without this, my life is absolutely miserable. When anything comes into our life to that extent, we know we're in bondage. We know it's an idol. Well, there's a great bondage breaker. And it's not an idea. It is not a concept. It is a living person. And that person, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the bondage breaker. Drugs, alcohol, sexual immorality, the occult, anger, unforgiveness, you name it. Whatever it is, only he can give real, true, and lasting freedom. All other things out there are real substitutes. That's all they are. They don't last. How can our sin bring us into bondage? I'd like to look at some scriptures today that talk about the awfulness of slavery, of bondage. In Proverbs 5, 22 and 23, it tells us about our sins, our iniquities. And it says, the iniquities of the wicked. Now you say, well, I'm not wicked, but we are, aren't we? And when we participate in sin, ongoing sin, we're participating in wickedness. And it says, the iniquities of the wicked ensnare him. They entrap him or her. And then the next part of that verse is very instructive. Besides being entrapped and snared, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. Have you ever thought about sin like big heavy rope, cords? You know, sometimes I think about the, the huge ropes they use on the ships. Have you ever seen those things? They are massive. I mean, unbelievable. Uh... Can you imagine being bound by that? Well, sometimes that bondage is so strong, it's like thick, heavy cords just binding us. So here we are, entrapped, ensnared, and wrapped with heavy cords. We just can't seem to get out. And it goes on to say in verse 23, He dies for lack of discipline. And because of the greatness of his folly, of his sin... Of his bondage, of his slavery, he is led astray. He's deceived. What a horrible picture of what sin can do to us. Isaiah picks it up and also describes that. Isaiah 64, 6b. The latter part of the verse, it says, We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, our sins, our bondages, like the wind, they just take us away. They just take us away. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, just sweep us away. We're gone. 
Wow, they're powerful. What happens when our idolatry, when our bondage, when our slavery is put before God? Well, certain things happen in our life. We become crooked. We become treacherous. By treachery, we mean guilty of involving betrayal. We betray others. We lie to others. We practice deception because this bondage to slavery has such a hold on us. We're involved in all kinds of wickedness. Maybe we used to be faithful, now we become unfaithful. We used to be trustworthy, now we become untrustworthy. We become false and unreliable. You say, well, that's a scary picture. It definitely is. Proverbs 11.3b says, The crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. The crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. You see, your sin will find you out. Pay now, play, uh, play now and pay later. It will catch up with you. It will catch up with you. And we know our enemy, the enemy of our souls, is to seek us and to kill us, to destroy us. That's his goal. That's his goal. Proverbs 11.5 says, But the wicked falls by his own wickedness. The things we do cause us to fall. We fall by our own wickedness. Psalm 7.15 elaborates on that. We make a pit, we dig it out, and we fall into the pit that we've made. You say, man, that's, that's a scary, scary thought. Bondage is real. Jeremiah 2.19 tells us, Your evil will chastise you. Isn't that an interesting thought? Our own sin chastises us. Our own sin disciplines us. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Oh, I can do it. It won't bother me. I can handle it. Don't worry about it. You know, no big deal. Do not be deceived. We can deceive ourselves thinking it'll be okay. I can handle this sin. It'll be all right. I can manage it. Do not be deceived. We can't mock God. Whatever we sow, that also will we reap. And that is the truth. And I think we realize that. Man, I was kidding myself. I was deceiving myself thinking I could handle this, thinking I could overcome it by myself, or thinking I didn't need to overcome it. I could live with it and be okay. I'm not hurting anybody, just myself. You see, our sin does hurt everybody. It hurts ourselves. It hurts our family. It hurts our friends. It affects our employment ruins our reputation, on and on we go. You say, that's a pretty dismal picture. Yes, that's, yes, it is. Sin is dismal, and we should hate it with a passion because of what it does. But you know, there is good news. There is good news that there really is, as we mentioned a moment ago, a bondage breaker. Turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3, 7 and 8, and we see God looking upon the children of Israel in their bondage. For hundreds of years they were in bondage. Did God care? Yes, He did. And what did He say in verses 7 to 8? And I, I very much liken this to the Lord Jesus. He says in verse 7, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. 
I know their sufferings. You see, God hears our cry. Even when God doesn't seem to be there, God is there. He hears our cry. He knows what we're going through. And he cares even more than we care. And he's concerned even more than we are concerned. He's our creator. And if anyone knows us, he does. But you say, okay, God, you, you've seen my affliction and you've heard my cry. That's great. And you know my sufferings that I'm in, but what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? Verse 8 tells us, And I have come down to deliver them. Amen? I have come down to deliver them. He's not just standing by. He's doing something. He's coming down to deliver them. Out of the hand of the Egyptians. You might say out of the hand of that which holds us captive. Out of the hand which makes us a slave. Out of the hands of our bondages. Whether it's anger and jealousy. Sexual immorality. Drugs. Alcohol. Whatever it is. He says I've come down to deliver you. And to bring you out of that land, to bring you out of that situation, to bring you out of that bondage to a good land, to a good place now, broad a land flowing with milk and honey. You see, it says, in Him we're blessed with every blessing in heavenly places. And He wants to bring us out of the darkness, out of the dominion of darkness, out of the power of Satan, into the marvelous light of the Son of His love, Jesus Christ. And that happens the moment we believe, the moment we trust Him. How exciting. How exciting. In Isaiah 63, 8 and 9, Isaiah says, as he speaks about his people he were, who were so wayward, they followed Him for a while, then they turned away, then they followed Him, then they turned away, and he says of them in 8 and 9, he says, For he said, Surely they are my people, Children who will not deal falsely. And it says, And he became their Savior. Now I want you to notice verse 9. Does God care? Does he really know? Does he really understand where I am? In verse 9 it says, In all their affliction he was afflicted. Can you imagine that? In all their affliction God himself was afflicted. Wow, I mean, that's an incredible thought. That God would know my suffering to such an extent that He would be afflicted because of my affliction. And He sent the angel of His presence and saved them. He saved them. And it says, And He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Dear friends, Jesus comes, he left his throne in heaven, he came down to earth, became one of us, clothed in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was afflicted with our afflictions, and yes, he was on the cross, wasn't he? And he saved us, and he wants to carry us, and strengthen us, and hold us. He is the real bondage breaker. There is no one who has fallen so deep, so low, and in such dark places, which seems to be so hopeless, where Christ, God the Son, cannot reach them. There is no hopeless case with Him. And that's so powerful to think about that. I want to ask you today, are you in some kind of bondage? Whether it's sexual whether it's anger, whether it's unforgiveness, whether it's jealousy, whatever it is, God knows. And He's afflicted with what you're going through. And He says, I can deliver you. I've come down to deliver you. I've come down to make you free. And He promises us that. Dear friends, are we taking advantage? Oh, maybe you can go to a, a consular 
and get a pep talk here and there and get some good advice and might help to some degree. But you know what? It doesn't deal with the sin problem. Only Christ can deal with that problem. You see, he died on the cross for our sins. And these are sin issues. And no amount of talk can deliver us from sin. It's only the blood of Jesus and his shed blood on the cross. We need to come to the cross. That's where the answer is. See, we were delivered when we were saved. We were delivered from the penalty of sin. We were delivered from the penalty of sin. But you see, we're dealing with the power of sin every day, even after we were saved. And he wants us to deliver us daily from the power of our sin. What is it called, sanctification? Being made to look more like Jesus every day, right? And all things work together for good. You mean my wicked, stinking, rotten situation can work together for good? Yes. How does he do that? How can God make that work together for good? And I believe I hear God answering back to my spirit, my soul. You don't have to know the how. You leave the how to me. All you have to know is the who. You trust me. I'll do the rest. Dear friend, we need to come to him. He is the only one that can make the difference. He is the true deliverer. What does it say in Colossians 1.13? He delivered us. Turn there for a second. Colossians 1.13. Great scripture. And he's praying a wonderful prayer for them, starting at verse 9. By the way, this is a great prayer. Sometimes uh, you might say, well, you know, I want to pray for other Christians, but, you know, what can I pray for? Okay, I pray for their health. I pray for their finances. I pray for this. If you ever want to know what to pray, look at the great prayers of the Bible. They're just packed with good stuff to pray for, for yourself, for your others. Anyway, verse 9, it says, and so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. Talking about the Colossian Christians. And what did he pray for for them? He prayed that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Dear friend, if you and I are going to overcome bondage of any kind, we need to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. How do we know? Where is it? It's found in the book of God, right? The Bible. So we need to be praying, I pray for John, I pray for Sally, that they may get into the Word, dig deeply into the Word, be filled with the knowledge of God's will, but not just any old way, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Some real depth, spiritual wisdom and understanding. You say, why? Why would I pray a prayer like that for someone to be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, we're talking about Christians who are struggling. Okay, it goes on to tell us in verse 10. So, as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. We want to be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so we can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Now, that's, that's an interesting statement. And I have to ask, am I walking? in a manner worthy of my Lord? That's a scary question to ask at times. I don't know about you, but even as a preacher, you know, I feel, man, there are so many ways I need to improve yet. Am I really walking in a manner worthy of the Lord? That's why we need to be praying for one another. Oh, God, help my brother, help my sister really walk in a way that pleases you, that glorifies you. Because the world is watching. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And now, as it goes on, it, it kind of unpacks that a little bit. What does that mean? Fully pleasing to Him. Is my life fully pleasing to Him? 2 Corinthians 5, 9, it says, We have made it our aim, our ambition, 
to be pleasing to Him. So when I get up in the morning, I say, this is what life is all about, to be pleasing to Him. You say, that's kind of a simple goal, isn't it? Yes, it is. But that's the goal the Apostle Paul had. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. That's what life is all about. For me to live is Christ. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm breathing. For me to live is Christ. You take Christ out of the equation, my life has no meaning. For me to live is Christ. And he goes on to say, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work. He wants me to be a fruit bearer. Not just sit on the bench, not just sit on the sidelines, but actually bearing fruit, doing things for Him. Ephesians 2 and 10 says that He's prepared things for us in advance that we should follow them, walk in them. He's prepared a life. Psalm 139 says that all of our life was written in His book when not even one day was lived. We're to live out that life. He's prepared for us, full of good works. You know, bearing fruit in every good work is doing it for the Lord, not doing it to draw attention to ourselves. That's what you say, Lord, when I, when I do this, I'm doing it for your glory, not for my glory. I like what one said, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. The prayer, the Lord's Supper as it ends. For thine is the kingdom. Lord, I'm not building my kingdom. Lord, I'm building your kingdom. Sometimes I get confused. I start building my kingdom. No, I'm here to build your kingdom. For thine is the kingdom and the power. Lord, it's not my power. It's your power. Without your power, I can't do anything. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So don't let me kid myself. It's your power that allows me to live the Christian life. It's your power that allows me to be victorious. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Lord, I am not here for, your glory, for my glory. I'm here for your glory. And sometimes I find myself drawing attention to myself and wanting to receive the glory that rightfully belongs to you. God, help me not to do that. So, living a life worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing and bearing fruit in every good work, and once again, increasing in the knowledge of God. We should keep growing in the knowledge of God. We never come to a place in our life where we say, I know enough. I've arrived. I don't need any more. We used to have a sign in one of the churches I used to attend when I was growing up, and it said, if you know all there is to know about the Bible, you don't need to attend Sunday school. You'd be surprised how many people knew how, all there is to know about the Bible. It's amazing. But the fact is we're always growing, always increasing, increasing in the knowledge of God. But then he goes on to say in verse 11 as he prays, that you may be strengthened with all power. Wow. like that. But it's his power, not ours. So we're praying for other believers. We're praying for one another to deal with our sin, our bondages, our struggles, whatever it is. We're praying that they might be filled with the knowledge of God and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We want to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and pleasing to Him. We want to bear fruit in every good work. We want to increase in the knowledge of God. And yes, we want to be strengthened with all power. Now you notice it says, according to His glorious might. It's His might. It's His glorious might. Is delegated power to overcome. We don't have it in ourselves. But then, then he goes on to say, for all endurance and patience with joy. I love that. Because his power, his glorious might will allow us to endure. Yes, you can. Through Christ. Endure with patience and with joy. Boy, you lose your joy, you've really lost something, right? And there's nothing more deadly than a joyous Christian to the world. Because you aren't going to attract, and I aren't, I'm not going to attract anyone if they see there's no joy in our life. Joy. Remember that hymn, There's Joy in Serving Jesus? 
Then it goes on to say, giving thanks to the Father, being a thankful Christian, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. We have a great inheritance, eternal life. And then finally, he talks about the bondage breaker here. He has, verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness. You and I lived in the domain of darkness. You and I lived under the powers and principalities of the earth. You and I were once sons of disobedience because not the Holy Spirit was working within us, but His Spirit, the evil one's Spirit, was working within us. But what did He do? He delivered us. Some translations say He rescued us. The greatest rescue operation ever when He rescued you. From darkness, and he brought you into light. He delivered you from the domain of darkness and transferred you into the kingdom of his beloved son. Wow, now that's the kingdom that we're a part of today. We're in the kingdom of his beloved son. We once were under Satan. We served him. He was our father. Remember Jesus said, You are of your father, the devil. Boy, what a powerful thing. And you do his works. Well, we used to be that way. We may not even have been aware of it. We probably would have denied it. But the reality is we were. That's the truth. But he delivered us. He transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption. What do you mean by that? The payment price. His blood has been paid. He redeemed us. And because of that, we have forgiveness of sins. Because you see, when God the Father looks at us through God the Son on the cross, He sees the very righteousness of Christ. He doesn't see that wickedness anymore. He sees the very righteousness of Christ. You see, because the Passover lamb died for us, and the blood was applied to us the moment we believed. Isn't that good to know? He delivered us. In Acts 26, 18, Paul giving testimony, talking about his calling, what God called him for. And by the way, God has called every Christian to do this. Not only the Apostle Paul. By sharing the good news. And by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. In 26, 18, he says, I'm doing this to open their eyes so that they may turn from the darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may turn from the darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And if that's happened to you, you can say, Amen. I have, my eyes have been opened. I see the truth now. Through the word of God, who I was, who I really am, how I need to grow in Christ. My eyes have been opened, and I've turned from the darkness now, and now I'm walking in the light. And if we're going to walk in the light, let's live as children of light. Let's be who we say we really are. This illustration I've given before about this young lady who was really lost and messed up in a big way and people used her and abused her and she even came to some quote-unquote so-called Christians who used her and abused her and she went on a terrible lifestyle crying out for help and then she met some Christians again who said they would help her. But she remembered the example of these other so-called Christians who said they would help her, but really used her. And she looked at them with a tearful eye, and she said, please be who you really say you are. Please be who you really say you are. You know? And something like that really touches my heart, because am I who I really say that I am? Jesus says in John 8, 
If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. That's the proof of the pudding. Living in his word, abiding in his word. Not talk. Living in his word, abiding in his word. Walking in the truth. He says, you're my disciples. That's the proof. You know, many people open their Bibles, go to church, but they live like the world the rest of the week. But he says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you or set you free. Now you notice it that he, you notice a lot of a lot of folks just quote that verse, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free or make you free. That's not so. Unless you're abiding in his word. Unless you're proving to be his disciples. You see, it's just not a concept. It's walking with the Savior day by day. As you do that, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Because a lot of folks might say, well, gee, I know a lot of these truths. How come I'm still in bondage? How come I'm not free? Are you walking with the Savior? Are you obeying Him? Are you translating it into daily life? Are you taking the words of God, putting them in your mind, and then living them out daily? Well, no, I'm not really doing that part, but I enjoy the Bible studies. I think the Bible studies are great. Ah, okay. You see, that's why you're not free. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free if you abide in His word. And it says, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. That's assurance. Now, how can Jesus assure that? He says, all authority, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. That's why he can say that. He can say that because he said, he who sees me See it, the Father. I and the Father are one. That's why he can say that. He can say that because he's God the Son. Truly God. Dear friends, we can engage in all kinds of idols, slavery, and bondages in our life. And they can take hold of us and if we let them, they'll destroy us. But if we come to the bondage breaker, Jesus Christ, He promises no matter what the bondage is, no matter what the slavery is, He will set us free and give us hope if we abide in Him. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for these words, for these truths. And Lord, may we realize that true freedom is found in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.